But uh, Brian's story, I think it's something that a lot of people are kind of talking about these days. But I think there can be some confusions of what Brian's story actually is. So take a kind of classic brand like Coke, uh, invented in 1886 by John Pendleton. Now for me, that, that's the brand's history, it's not their story. For me, brand's story is about how customers feel about the brand. So it's when you've got a can of Coke in your hand, how you feel, even if it's unconscious. And for me, it's all those kind of like the great American dream. It, you know, even the, the ads now, it's all about happiness and the Christmas ads, it's all about, it's got a kind of 50s feel. So it's when everyone was looking towards America, that's what encapsulates Coke for me. And that's what I think of as brand story. So, you know, like, you know, the traditional story, you know, is, is Coke's history, much the same as a, a book or a film. Whereas with brand story, there's all these different stories going on. In fact, every consumer has their own version of a brand story for your brand. So, and it's organic, you know, things can change. I, you know, I might feel that about Coke, someone else might feel completely different. And things can go wrong and then, you know, the, the, the kind of, your standing changes completely. Um, but I think, yeah, good brand storytelling, it really does make the brand come alive. So I've got um, five kind of what I call tips to um, help you tell a better brand story. So the first one is obviously be truthful. Um, you know, if problems turn up in your business, don't hide them uh, because they'll come out later. And you know, with social media these days, it causes lots of problems. So as you know, BW found out. <laughs> you know, and I think also that, that the story. You know, it's the kind of classic thing where the CEO resigns, and it's not not enough for people. It's not going to suddenly change. And people, they think it's that kind of line about those tests is throughout the organisation. So, you know, they, they were right at the top of their category and now they're, they're right at the bottom. So, what do they do? Well, you know, at the weekend they're running these full page ads in the national press saying, we've broken the most important part of our vehicles, your trust. And... It's, it's saying that they'll fix the cars that are affected, but they're only going to fix those. And, you know, that's like the bare minimum. That's not going to change the brand story of Volkswagen. They've got to do not just all Volkswagen owners, but, you know, everyone who owns a car is a potential Volkswagen buyer. So, you know, they need to just do something like offer £100 free off every service to every VW buyer or invite members of the public or people who are interested in cars into the factory to see how they do things. They've, got to, they've really got to step on it. And obviously, they've got a kind of time window for this, I think. So uh, an example I think they should look towards is someone else who had uh, lots of success on the roads, uh, Brand Armstrong, you know, seven um, Tour de France's and was amazingly successful, started his own charity. And he had that little window of opportunity his uh, Oprah interview, and, and he blew it. You know, he, he admitted to taking all the, the enhancing drugs, but the lying and bullying of the team, he didn't fully um, open up to that. He didn't completely admit to it. And if he'd been completely open, he could have maybe gone on to do things, but he kind of was a bit cagey about it, and, and that was his, his time, really. Uh, and this is what's happening with VW, this is the lawyer who's dealing with all the complaints for the VW owners whose cars are affected. And uh, so he said the way in which this is being handled by VW is staggering. Rather than responding to very serious concerns from their customers, they're providing minimal information. So, you know, they've got their kind of open mo moment and, and they're just blowing it. Really. So I think that the who cares wins. Customer service is such a, a huge thing. Um, because, you know, it's all very well spending lots of money on uh, big campaigns, but it's, it's how, it's that feeling someone has to do with your, your company. And so, uh, you know, it's, if you've got a supermarket or a shop, that's great because you've got the kind of weekly time where you're meeting people. And I think it's a great chance to talk to customers <coughs> and make them feel better about your brand. Um, 
And really, this is amazing. This is uh, Malcolm Gladwell found this in his book Blink. But basically, uh, doctors who are sued for malpractice, uh, the ones who were sued weren't necessarily the worst doctors. They were the ones who listened worst and um, treated their patients worst. So it's that thing of being listened to is so important. It makes so much difference to people. So that's why I think, you know, call centres, you know, why not call them brand story building departments? And also I think a lot of companies, you know, you go to the website and you try to find a number to call, call a call centre and it's hidden away somewhere. And then if you do get through, it's, it's you know, a call centre with um, someone speaks in a strong English accent you can't understand. You can only say what three times after, after four times it's getting a bit rude, and you know they read from a script. But it makes to building a brand story, your relationship with the company. It makes so much difference if you, you know, you talk to a normal person and you just have a chat to them. I had a problem with my broadband and was chatting to someone from Sky, and you know I actually worked at Sky for a while. I don't have a, I don't really know what their kind of mission statement is. But that, just that conversation with him, it really changed my, my feeling towards Sky. It just helpful, didn't rush me, and, and it was just easy going. It was just a normal conversation. So this is a company that has got service right at the middle of their company, the heart of the company. Zappos, they're kind of, they, mainly, they sell some fashion, but mainly shoes, an American company. Um, and you know, they say the service company that happens to sell shoes. And, you know, obviously it's a bit of a problem with a shoe company that's online. So that's why they have free delivery both ways, 365 day return policy. And their longest call was actually 10 hours and 29 minutes, which uh, I don't think even a Melvin Marcos could talk about shoes for that long. So, uh, but you know, obviously it wasn't all about shoes, but they listened to that person. And that's their kind of attitude. And then they do this thing where, if you join there, after you've been there for a week, um, they'll offer you $2,000 to quit. Because they want people who are determined to, who really want to work there. So, and they say, I think only, actually only about 2 to 2, 3% need. So it works out for them in the end. Uh, and their mission statement, you know, which I think all companies could benefit from, make every encounter with customers count. Give them a unique experience and you'll be sure to reap the benefits for years to come. So, number two, uh, be insightful. You know, find, uh, you know, as Daryl's saying, find this kind of insight, this strategy about a, a product or brand. Well, a good example is Marmite, you know, with their kind of love and hate campaign. It's now been running nearly 20 years, which is a long, long time for an advertising campaign. <coughs> And again, that came about from the creatives in the office, an art director and writer. One of them loved Marmite and one hated it. And I think that's, you know, like it's, it's fresh because it's people hating Marmite. And what's interesting, over time, they've still got people talking about hating it. And I think that just makes people love, us, love it more. So I think, you know, that's a, a good example. So find that, that insight that people can relate to. Uh, be original. That's what they're saying. Everyone wants to be the first person to do something second, and uh, you know I think that's very true. Everyone wants to someone else to take the risks and then jump on the bandwagon. But there's no story in you know in coming second. It's all about who was first. So uh, this is an example of car ads. If, I think if I had shares in uh, windy Italian mountain roads, I'd be very rich by now. <laughs> you know, they all seem to look exactly the same. And then, for instance, Lexus, when you get a line like that, amazing emotion. It's just kind of, you, you can get that at the end of the car, and it's just like auto wallpaper. It's just, it just washes over you. But what they've done is, you know, they've often got these lines that are kind of very hyperbolic. But what they've done is, They've brought this. They, they've done a different sort of car advertising, so they brought this this line to life.
no, Lexus aren't selling hoverboards, unfortunately. <laughs> but um, yeah, so, so what they've done, and they've, this, this whole campaign, they have actually worked out what the technology that's needed to create a real hoverboard. And online you can see videos like the making of it, and also the, um, they've got a kind of video, got about 15 million views, which is, you know, kids on skate, in a skate park on, on these hoverboards. So, um, but what this does is, obviously it's nothing about cars, but it's all about nothing is impossible. It's showing how hard they'll, do, they'll work to do things. And it shows the technology and their engineering skill. So it creates a great brand story and it reflects the kind of company they are. So you think all that technology and engineering prowess they'll put into Lexus. And it certainly, from just a, like another executive car, it changed, certainly changed my impression and built my brand story image up of who they are. And next one for uh, B. <coughs> so, uh, probably all remember this the um, Christmas ad for Sainsbury's. Now, a lot of people might say, oh, that's a good example of storytelling. And I think this is where the difference between brand story and storytelling. I think it's a good example of storytelling, explaining about the, you know, the Christmas truce in 1914. But I'm not so sure if it's a great example of brand story. Because I think a lot of people. At the start, you don't know it's an ad, it feels like a, a short film. And when Saying for his Christmas is it for sharing comes on the end, it, it kind of jars a bit, makes, makes people feel a bit uncomfortable. It certainly did me. And actually, it's the fourth most complained ad about this of the year. So, you know, you've got to do something that works with your company. I think it's like, you know, you hear those stories of an actor or actress, they go up to the director, they've been studying this part for ages, and they go, I don't really feel that my character would say this. <coughs> so, you know, if you think of your brand as a character, you've got to kind of work in the confines of what they would do and what people would believe. So, and obviously, once social media get hold of it, you know, if they, they're not happy with it, they're just going to make fun of it. <laughs> so, uh, and also find what's special about your brand and then really bring it to life because that's what creates a story. So Paul Smith, um, <coughs> I would say, you know, classic tailoring with a twist. Um, I asked some at the workshop what they thought. You know, they describe uh, Paul Smith, and they said stripey. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, yeah, I think Paul Smith, they're great about building the story and build, giving that little kind of twist to how they do things. So I'm going to show you a, a short kind of promotional film. And um, in that, it's for a suit to travel in. Like for a lot of kind of fashion brands, you might expect beautiful models getting off planes after a long haul trip. The suit looks perfect. Because it's Paul Smith, they communicate the same message but do it in a completely different way. <laughs> Hello everybody, I'm in London Savile Row. We're here as part of the London Menswear Collection. These artists are about to show a suit to travel in. It's a navy blue suit, uh, very simple, but it's in a fabric which is so fantastic and full of life. And you'll see they can do the most amazing things, stand up and it's perfect to go. Yeah, so I think that's a great example of uh, you know bringing it to life in an interesting way, but it's authentic with the brand as well. And you know, Red Bull, another great example. <coughs> right from the start, they've had this line gives you wings, 
and you know, like just being involved in everything to do with extreme sports just brings the brand to life. You know, like the feet to guard the jump, and you know, like magazines and events, everything to do with extreme sports that they sponsor. Uh, I think really just helps build that brand story. Uh, and you know, you can have heroes in brand stories, as much like fictional stories. Um, so here's you know, there's a few different story types. Here's one. A dangerous monster threatens the community. One person takes it upon themselves to defeat the beast and restore happiness to the kingdom. So it could be Jaws or Alien, or it could be uh, Richard Branson and BA. So, you know, you've got all, the, and all these kind of um, brand heroes, often that, you know, they're the founder of the company. And they need, like in, in stories in fiction, that move along with conflict. So they need a form of conflict. So they've got, they're all fighters of convention. Uh, but then, of course, there's problems if you build your brand story around a kind of charismatic leader, whereas, you know, with Steve Jobs and, and Denise Rodick, you know, when they're not around anymore, things change. And I think, you know, with Apple now, I don't know what you'll feel, but, you know, now Tim Cook's in charge. As a brand, I just feel slightly, it's just slightly lost it a bit more. It just isn't as cool somehow. So, you know, there's dangers if you build your brand around a like that. But obviously, because it's a person, it's easier to build story because we can actually interest in people. So I just want to finish with um, uh, talking about Apple because I think they're, they're great brand storytellers. Um, you know, like when they launched the iPod, it wasn't the 32 megabit music player. It had a thousand songs in the pocket, in your pocket. And I think it really started when Steve Jobs came back to Apple in 1997. Um, and he'd only been there for like eight to ten weeks. And instead of doing an ad with lots of nice products in it, he just did, you know, ran something that was all about how to make you feel about the brand and what they, they felt about it and what it stood for. Here's to the crazy ones. The misfits. The rebels. The troublemakers, the round pegs in the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules, and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. About the only thing you can't do is ignore them, because they change things. They push the human race forward. And while some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. Okay, so I think what's important is to really bring your brand to life and find something special, authentic and original about it. And, and you know make people feel different about it. Thank you.